turn on the overhead view. Look at that, a magnetic eraser. It's like high tech. So we are going to start chapter 13 here. All right, so take some good notes here, kind of put away all the other stuff you're working on because you're going to definitely need your undivided attention for this material. This is the beginning of chapter 13, and I plan on spending three classes in this subject, or at least that's the plan. You know, if we can do it in two, we'll do it in two, but a lot of times I need three, three weeks to kind of cover this stuff. But things have been, you know, they're, they're always changing. So chapter 13 deals with corporations. And can you see that okay, or should I make it a little bit bigger? No. You're good? Okay. All right. All right. So um, the best way that I can kind of get this started is to kind of compare and contrast to what you already know. Okay. So I'm going to put over here on this side of the screen. You know, maybe I'll do this side in yellow or something like that. And this side, just pick a different color for now, green. And in green, we're going to see the new stuff. And in yellow, it's the stuff you've known prior to today. Okay, so I'm just going to call it non-corporations. So accounting one stuff, accounting two stuff, everything prior to chapter 13. So even though I'm going to focus on maybe like a sole proprietor, what we did last week with partnerships can apply to what's in yellow as well. It's just not going to be the full performance. So let's say um, you may remember the very first, one of the very first journal entries you ever learned in accounting one, and that was an owner investment. If you saw a question Maybe it was in your portfolio. Maybe it's, you know, uh, in, a, in a regular scenario that you're dealing with a problem. The first thing you typically see is the owner making an investment. And that journal entry typically looks like this. Assuming the owner invested cash. And that should be one of the most familiar familiar entries to you um, if you know you've paid attention at all in accounting one. Uh, it's usually the very first entry when you start a business from scratch. In a corporation, the owners are stockholders. Okay, so immediately the language and the lingo is going to change. So we're going to get some new account titles in the mix because we've never had to use them before because we were never in corporations before. So the equivalent of an owner investment is the issuance of 
of stock. So owner investment is the same thing as stock issuance. So when a corporation issues stock, that's like you know giving ownership to these owners. So owners buy stock and now they become an owner in the business. There are two different ways that you're going to see this ownership of stock journalized. One way is if the stock is issued at par, and the other one is if the stock is issued above par. So if stock issued at par, the journal entry looks something like this. You would debit cash. And you would credit something called capital stock. Looks a lot like the one in yellow. It's got the word capital in it. Now, it's only going to have the word capital in it here in the beginning, just so I can show you that it's basically the same idea. But then when we get really into it, there are two forms of capital stock that a corporation can issue, common stock and preferred stock. Okay, So I just want you to make a connection that capital stock can be either common or preferred. So when you see the journal entries, let's say, in the textbook, they will most likely use common stock or preferred stock instead of capital. So by me saying capital, I'm kind of being generic. Okay, But I most likely would want to be more specific. I can tell you, uh, just as a little side note here, that most corporations only issue common stock. In fact, 75% approximately, and that changes, you know, yearly, but only 75% of companies have just common. Okay, so that means only 25% have common and preferred. So, so 75% of publicly traded companies only issue common stock. Common stock is what trades on the stock market. Preferred stock is more of an internal stock that employees might get. Think of like stock options, even though they're not the same thing. But you might give, let's say, a vice president some preferred stock. That preferred stock is convertible to common, and then that person can then sell that common stock and get money for it. Right? So uh, there's two types of stocks, common and preferred. Common is what's most common, as the name implies. So preferred is kind of like if your company offers preferred stock, it's like, oh, that's weird. That's not that, that's not that common, no pun intended. All right, so 75% of all the corporations out there just have common. Only a quarter of them have common and the preferred. You can't have just preferred. Everybody's got common, only 25% have common and preferred. So when you issue stock at par, the journal entry looks like what I just wrote there, debit cash, credit, capital, stock. Now, eventually, I will change that to common stock. Okay.
I can also tell you that every time you credit the stock account, let's see if I can put this. It is recorded at par. So every time you credit common stock, or if they call it preferred stock, or if they want to be generic and call it capital stock, every time you credit stock, it's recorded at the par value. So let's talk about what's par value. So hopefully you've got an opportunity to reach after 13. In this blended environment, you're always supposed to kind of be a step ahead of me, so to speak. But um, if you didn't, par value is an arbitrary value that is established when like, the corporation first got created. It's not the stock price. It's just a value to kind of get the ball rolling when a corporation becomes a corporation. Right? It's more of an accounting thing, all right, so that they can do journal entries, put some type of value on the stock so that they can proceed with the accounting process. What dictates the stock price are people, you know, other companies that, you know, supply and demand, you know, all of a sudden there's a run on stock and that price starts going up, you know. When there's, a, when there's no demand on that stock, that stock price starts coming down. So par value has no bearing on the stock price. Right? It's an independent, arbitrary value. So just understand that every time you do a problem, they will always tell you the par. $5 a share, $1 a share, $1 par, $0.10 cents per share, par. They'll always tell you. Now, in some of the examples that are in the textbook, they might use a $5 or a $10 par value. That's really high, right? Most par values are usually a dollar or less. There are exceptions, but typically par values are very low. And the reason why they're very low is that in most states, it's illegal to sell stock below par. So if you make it $10 a share originally and the price goes down below 10 at some point, you're going to go, oh, my God, I'm not breaking the law. And so in some states, it's illegal to sell stock below par. So to avoid that whole controversy, they make the par value super low so that it's, there's no chance that the market comes below that number. Okay? So you might see high pars in the textbook, and they're just doing that for example purposes not for reality purposes, okay? So if stock is issued at par, how can I make that stand out? Then this is the journal entry. If stock is issued above par, now we're going to need three lines in the journal entry. So the journal entry would look like this. We would still debit cash because, again, you're the corporation and people are buying in to your company to become an owner. That's how the company raises capital. The word capital. That's how they raise money. So it's like, hey, you want to be an owner in our company? Buy shares of our stock. And then that's how we're able to get money. That's kind of like starting us off. Okay? We might decide to go borrow to get cash in our business, or you can issue stock. Okay? So you would debit cash for whatever the selling price of that stock might be. You would credit the capital stock again. And I'm going to remind you this time that this has to be at par. So every time you credit, I'm actually going to go and put it up top as well now that I've talked about it.
but then there would be a new account or a third part of this transaction and this would be called paid in capital in excess of par. So this would be the journal entry if you issued stock above par. Again, just like the first time you learned debits and credits back in Chapter 2 of Accounting 1, every time you do a journal entry, there's a minimum of two moves. You have to have at least one debit. You have to have at least one credit. So these two credits have to add up to that debit. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples. So let's say example one, company issues a thousand shares at one dollar par value for a thousand dollars. So the company is issuing a thousand shares at a dollar a pop and they're selling them for a thousand dollars. So what you sell them for is your cash. Your stock is how many shares did you sell at Harvard? So, in essence, we didn't sell above par, so the journal entry would be to debit cash for $1,000. And we're going to credit common stock, we'll pretend it's common, thousand shares at $1 par. That's what the journal entry would look like. You would want to put that map next to the words common stuff. You could put it underneath as an explanation as well, but a lot of times it's you'll see it right next to the debit or the credit. So we sold a thousand shares of a dollar par for a thousand dollars and we got a thousand for it. Now, the second example I bet will help clean up and help you understand this first example. So let's say example two. Company issues a thousand shares. That didn't mean to be a dollar sign, by the way. Maybe that's what's messing me up. Let me get rid of that dollar sign. Okay. So company issues a thousand shares at one dollar par for three thousand dollars. Company issues a thousand shares of one dollar par common stock for three thousand dollars. So, how much money did we get? We got three thousand. We now need to credit common stock for the par value. 
how many shares, 1,000 shares, at $1 par, every time you credit common stock, it's always at par. Right now, my debit doesn't equal my credit. So obviously, my credit side needs a little extra help. And that's where that paid in capital, and you guys can abbreviate paid in capital if you want. You can write pick. Instead of paid in capital, just type pick in excess of par. Save you a little bit of writing. And what will make up that difference? 2,000, right? So what is the amount above par? Well, if the par is $1,000, the amount above par would be 2000 Debits have to always equal credits. So let's go into the textbook, and let's do an example out of the textbook. So you want to go to Chapter 13. And you want to be kind of like around page, let's go 370, I'm sorry, 477, page 477. So I know it's kind of probably hard to read. You might need to shine your phone on it unless your computer screen is bright. So we're going to look at XQS 13-2, right at the top of page 477. Does everybody have the new book? If you don't have the new book, just find QS 13-2. And if you don't have the new book, I'll just type it here. So you don't even have to worry about it. All right, so in the new book, page 477, here's what it says says prepare the journal entry to record Zenday Company QS 13-2. But I'm typing it here anyways. Zenday Companies issuance of 75,000 shares of $5 par value Common stock. Did you find it in the old book? Page 486. Wow. All right. So page 486 or page 570. Wow. What a difference. Okay. So one of those has to be the right page for you. Okay, so this is QS 13-2. So let me continue writing here. Uh, assuming the share sell for And they gave us two scenarios. A. Five dollars. Thank you. Five dollars cash per share. It's hard to see. And what's B? Six dollars. Okay. So I'm going to shut up just for a second.
And I know that's very hard for me to do, so try to get this done quicker than later because I'll have to start talking. But you basically are going to end up with those last two blues that we did. That's pretty much what A and B is going to look like. So see if you can come up with the right amounts. That's what the first one should have looked like. Again, I'm showing the math in the body of the journal entry. You don't technically have to do that, but I just want to show you technically what's happening. Right? 75,000 times $5 par is the common stock. And then we sold those 75,000 shares for $5. So. Selling price is five, but par is five. So 
for the depth of the credit match up. In B, you're going to debit cash, but now we're selling them for $6 a share. So 75,000 shares multiplied by $6, you're now going to credit common stock. For the par value, so 75,000 shares at the $5 par. And that would be 375. So that means our pick in excess of par would be technically, if I wanted to break this down, I could say 75,000 shares multiplied by how much above par per share are we? One. One. So that's another way to show the detail. So if the par value is five and we sell it for six, the amount in excess of par is one. So notice 75,000 times six, 75,000 times five, 75,000 times four. These two, five and one, add up to six. 375 and 75 add up to four. So it used to just be the owner made an investment, cash, credit, capital. Now you have this little environment that you have. Any questions on this example that we just did? So when it comes to easy, medium, hard, this is the easy of the stuff. This is like the basic basics of corporation stuff. Now you may come across some stuff that you will find easier than this. You definitely will find some stuff that's harder than this. But this is like first tier. You've got to know how to do the introductory journal entry. Eventually, this will be old hat for you. Okay? It just isn't that way now because you're just learning. Nothing is easy the first time you see it most, most of the time. But it will become easier as we go along. Okay. Just remember, every time you credit stock, no matter what we're doing, whether it's day one, day two, or day three of this unit, every time you credit stop, it better be in par. All right, so notice here I credited comma stock, it's at par. Here I credited comma stock, it's at par. Here I credited comma stock, it's at par. Every time you credit stock, you always record it at par. So if you happen to sell it at par, it's just two moves. If you sell it above par, then you need three moves. You've got to make up that difference. How much over par did you sell it for? So you just got to acknowledge that. Right? So what we used to know as capital, we now already have two 
versions of the capital account. Common stock and things. So let me show you more from a T account perspective. So we know capital is a liquor account. And if it's a liquor account, that means it carries a credit balance. It goes up by a credit. Okay? Liquor accounts go up by a credit. They go down by a debt. Well, we're going to have a whole slew of corporation version capital accounts. Okay? So instead of having just one capital, we already have seen common stock and pick long freaking title, but that's typically If I can make it centered, there we go. So if common stock has a pick account, believe it or not, so does preferred. So preferred stock, and it too has a pick account associated with it. So this is a chapter you definitely want to read, even though you know you may have tried it at first, and you may have said this seems Greek to me, but. If you go back and reread it after this presentation, you should see probably, you know, a little bit of a difference in reading and comprehension. Right? I'm pretty sure I have a YouTube video as well on what I'm doing. Um, so you may want to check that out in addition to this. But this little list of T accounts here in the green section, the new section, will continue to grow. I know. Whereas in the old yellow section, we just had one basic capital account. And now we're going to see capital wearing multiple hats. So instead of just wearing one hat like, a, like it did in a non-corporation setting, capital is wearing different hats. Oh, let me put on my common stock hat. Let me put on my pick an excess of par hat. You know, one for preferred, and then another pick for, um, you know, common, <clears throat> so on and so forth. There are more. Okay, let me throw another one at you here. Another account, which is a major, major player in corporate accounting, is something called retained earnings. In fact, a lot of times when I might teach corporations for the first time, I might say, hey, capital used to wear one hat over here, and now it wears two hats, stocks, stock accounts, group them into one category, and then retain earnings is the other. So we get all these different stock accounts, which I can label as stock accounts, and then I have this retain earnings account. So if, if you were to maybe be pressed on a, on a test and say, what, what accounts are really representing capital 
in the corporation environment, it would be stock accounts and retain earnings. So retain earnings is like a whole hat all to itself. And then these stock accounts are a whole hat all to themselves. Where am I going with this? Well, let's go over something that is a really good thing for me to go over tonight because a lot of you are working on your portfolio, finishing it up. And in that portfolio, at one point, you will have to do closing entries. And again, we looked at closing entries probably week one of this course. So it was like 10 weeks ago. So I don't know how clear you remember that, but if you're anything like me, I don't remember what I did last week, let alone 10 weeks ago. Right. Unless, <laughs> yeah, unless I'm doing it on a regular basis, which is what I do, but you guys know, you know, so unless you really understood it the first time around, you know, uh, it's like getting back on that horse and practicing again so you can really feel comfortable riding again. Okay. So let's talk closing entries now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue this yellow versus green thing, non-corporations versus corporations. But now the subject is going to be closing entries. So we're going to review closing entries under the yellow, which will help you with your project. But then I obviously have to show you how to do them in a corporation setting. Okay, so under closing entries, if you remember, there are four closing entries, three mandatory ones, fourth if you happen to have drawn, right? So if the owner made a withdrawal, then you would do that one. So the first closing entry, if you recall, goes something like this. We are going to close your revenue into income summary. That's your first closing entry. Remember, you may remember from accounting one and maybe that first week we were in here I referred to this as the red accounts. We've got to close out the red account. So that's what we're doing. So closing revenue into income summary. I'm actually going to move these guys over to the left. Actually, you know what? No, I'm going to keep it right where it is. So closing revenue into income summary. So remember, revenue is a liquor account, carries a credit balance. When you close, you've got to do the opposite to shut it down to zero. So something with a credit balance, to close it, you've got to debit it. So you're going to debit your service revenue in the assignment that you have in this portfolio. Uh, it'll be sales revenue you could have both by the way if you're like a, a beauty salon you might sell shampoo and also perform services so these would be on separate lines but I'm just doing it to save a little space here so <clears throat> service revenue more of accounting one sales revenue more accounting two but then you would credit income summary for the same amount. And the reason why I have put this journal entry kind of like straddling the yellow and the green is because you would have no idea looking at this closing entry if you were closing for a sole proprietorship, partnership, or corporation. Closing entry number one is the same in both. Okay? There's no corporation lingo that's different. Revenue is revenue is revenue. Right? You got to close it. And you close it into income summary. Okay? So the good news is closing entry number one, identical 
under both environments. The second closing entry, I'm also going to be straddling. Second closing entry is to close expenses into income summary. Except that's not how you spell expenses. It looks like the French version. Expense. So when we want to close expenses, remember they carry a debit band. So to close them, we got to credit them. So that means you're going to be debiting income summary. And you're going to be crediting. Now, this is wink, wink to help you with the portfolio. I'll use a lot of the accounting two stuff that you might run into. You'll be crediting cost of goods sold in the century. You will be crediting, if you have it, sales, returns, and allowances. Who knew you were going to get a portfolio help tonight as well? I knew. Sales discounts. I answered my own question. My own student there for a second. Who knew I was you were going to get help with portfolio? I knew. Such a loser. Okay. Sales discounts. I've been miserable all week long. My back has just been like shot literally since Mother's Day. My my back has been bothering me. And I keep going to chiropractors and masseuses and nothing seems to be working, you know. I'm just so frustrated. But today I had just a little glimmer of like, oh, not 100% pain. You know, it's like 70% pain and I'll take it. But so I'm a little happier than normal. As if you'd see me at home, I'd be like just a just an SOB. <laughs> just I'm just so angry all the time because I'm in so much pain. I know I should. <laughs> Anyways, um, so debit cost to get sold, debit sales returns a lot. So we credit all of these guys because uh, normally they're debited. And then you would also be crediting your regular expenses, your operating expenses. You're selling general administrative, like your telephone expense, your rent, your advertising, your depreciation, those guys. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to put S, G, and A. So these are all those other ones. Your selling expenses, your general expenses, your administrative expenses. I'm just not listing that. But depreciation, telephone. Um, sometimes they even call this SAG in real life accounting, selling administrative general. So that's actually a kind of a common abbreviation there. Okay. So maybe I should do that too instead of breaking rank and coming up with my own new phrase. <clears throat> so the your SAG expenses, okay? Selling administrative in general. Again, Notice how I've straddled the yellow and the green, and that is because both closing entry number one and closing entry number two are the exact same under these two environments. So I am just going to highlight the R in red. I'm going to highlight the E in expenses just to remind you of red. All right, we're going to see red happening. All right, so now here's where some changes start to happen. When you get to closing entry number three, this is where the two start to differentiate each other, differentiate each other from. Okay, oops, I got that one All right, so closing entry number three. We'll do the one that we know very well, and that is we want to close your income summary and do you remember what we closed nope not yet 
what do we close income summary into? Capital, very good. That's closing entry number three in terms of instructions. So if you recall, we close revenue into income summary, we close expenses into income summary, now we close income summary. So if your revenue was greater than your expense, that means you have a net income. Same information would be found on the income statement. From an income summary point of view, income summary would have a credit balance if you have a net income because your revenue represents the credit side, the debit side represents the expense side. So if the revenue is bigger than the expense, you must have a net income. So if you have a net income, income summary will carry a credit balance. So how do you close it? You've got to debit it. So closing entry number three, if you have a net income, would be to debit income summary and to credit capital. If you had a loss, this is the only closing entry that could be flip-flopped. Only one of the four. So if you had a loss, I would be debiting capital and crediting income summary. I'm sure you probably remember that from accounting one. Probably not. <laughs> Let's continue with this yellow side. Closing entry number four. We now close drawing. And we close it into capital. So here's the D in red. So if drawing is a debit aid account, that means it carries a debit balance. So to close it, we got to credit it. So that means you got to debit capital. So So the ones that I'm doing in yellow are the ones you're going to be doing in your portfolio last part. I don't know. I can't remember if anybody has gotten to that point yet. My, my memory's not too good tonight. But if you have gotten to the closing entries, they should have looked like what I've done so far. If you haven't gotten there, this is what they will look like, except you will be more detailed than me here. Go we'll write all the expenses, depreciation expense, telephone expense, limits of expense, advertising, whatever expenses you have. You want to bring me in like I do. So those are the four closing entries if you're in a non-corporation. Even last week when we were doing partnerships, they still don't look like this, except instead of having one capital account, you have partnership capital accounts. Two partners, two capitals. Two partners, two drawings. So your, the basis of closing entries is the same for partnership as it was for, you know, um, sole proprietorships. But when you get to corporations, Check this out. Closing entry number three now looks like this. We're now going to still close income summary. You dump the revenue and you dump the expenses into income summary. Now you're going to close income summary into hat number two, retained earnings. So basically, to make a long story short, retain earnings is replacing capital in the closing entry process. So whatever you used to do to capital, you now will substitute retained earnings in its place. So that means retained earnings is going to be in this spot, and retained earnings is going to be in this spot. You literally but it's will basically substitute. the same thing, right? Basically the same it's thing. It's just different names. Different names because... You have stockholders instead of just an individual or a couple of partners. Okay, so the journal entry would look like this: debit 
income summary and credit retained earnings. Now, when I have taught accounting one at MCC, the students at MCC in chapter one, they don't learn capital and drawing. They learn retained earnings and dividends. That's just the way their book is set up. So it's already corporate lingo from day one. But if I start talking about capital and drawing, they're totally clueless. What are you talking about? What's capital? What's drawing? They don't learn that until later. Like we don't learn corporation until later, like at this point. So it's kind of weird. And it's basically the SUNY initiative. So like if those students were to go to like, let's say SUNY Geneseo or SUNY Brockport, SUNY Geneseo and SUNY Brockport kind of like control MCC's accounting program. Not really, but they're saying, hey, if you're going to have that two plus two program, we want to make sure that you teach accounting in our style, which is starting from corporation right off the get go. So if you've ever been in my YouTube channel, you will notice I'll have like one video, uh, closing entries for a non-corporation, yellow, corporation, uh, closing entries for a corporation, green. So like my MCC students would watch the one video, my Brian Strat students would watch the other video because it's, you know, you're dealing with apples and oranges, so to speak. So at some point, both you guys and them get to the same point. It's just two different paths to get there but you eventually get to the same spot, okay? So it's funny, when I teach my uh, online class at Colorado Tech, what they're doing an assignment right now, get this, they're in week three of five, five week courses, right? They're in week three, think of accounting one, they're already learning closing entries. So week one, they learn debits and credits. Week two, they learned adjustments, Week three, they learn closings. I had 35 students to start off with. I think I might have half of them. You're asking so much of students to learn what we learn in 15 weeks to learn it in five. I'd want to pull my hair out if I were. You know, I'm like, watch my videos. Please watch the videos. Half of them don't watch. You know, and what's interesting is because I teach the yellow right? And all of a sudden when a student does a discussion board, you can tell they went online because all of a sudden in their discussion board, well, you know, you would close, you know, into retain earnings and you would close into, and I'm like, we never talked about that. So I know they just went there, copied, you know, Googled or whatever, and I just instantly know they're, they're not really, they're not in it. You know what I mean? They're not watching the videos. They're not watching the classes like they're supposed to. So there's certain things from a professor standpoint that's like so obvious, right? Like, oh my God, you just can't fake us. You know, we used to do that kind of stuff. We were better at it. You know, these guys aren't as good as we used to be in terms of faking it. But, but yeah, so it's kind of interesting to see that, you know, knowing that, okay, they weren't really paying attention to the, to the stuff I taught. They went somewhere else and grabbed it and they're talking apples when they should have been talking oranges. You know, it's very interesting. Kevin, you had a question? No, um, <clears throat> it's like a two-part question. Uh, it's like from your perspective and then from the students' perspective, what is easier for teaching and what's just easier for teaching? I think our way is easier. I don't like the corporation, MCC, SUNY, Geneseo, or SUNY initiative. I don't like that way. I like how we do it, you know, and wait till this chapter to kind of get exposed to it. The stuff that's in this chapter, they see for the first time as well. They just know retained earnings instead of capital from the get-go, and they know dividends instead of draw. That's all they know. They don't know anything that's in this chapter until they get to this chapter. They just know the language. But it takes them, I don't know exactly when it, they get exposed to capital and drawing. I think it depends on the teacher. Like, I'll try to interject it here and there to try to explain to them what that is but i like this this approach way better you know and wait till hey there's a chapter called corporations 
like we're learning right now, that's the appropriate time to show there's another way to do stuff if you're in this other environment. So I think from a student perspective, uh, I think the, the long-term retention is better this way, even though there's anomalies and exceptions in every one of those. But I, I, I believe that. But I could be biased, too, because this is the way I learned it. It's the way I've taught it for, you know, over 35 years here at MCC. I think maybe 10 years ago, we switched to, literally switch. We did it this way. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, by the way, you know, we have a new book, and the book is using retained earnings and dividends in the first chapter. So you've got to switch to that style. You know how hard it was for me to do that because I'd be so used to saying it and I go and capital and they're like, what's capital? I'm like, oh my God, I didn't mean to say capital. I meant retained earnings, you know? So it's a little bit of a pain in the ass for me, but eventually it's like, okay, where am I? What am I doing? Okay, um, go, you know, lights are on. Uh, you you kind of you kind of know what you're doing, but at first I was always mixing them up and I felt really bad, but eventually got it. Okay, so I kind of kind of let the cat out of the bag a little bit because in closing entry number four, we are now no longer have drawing. We now have a new D in red called dividends. So, uh, you know, after I invented my little debit aid and liquor, you have no idea how happy when I went, oh, my God, red works for this and debit aid still works. And it's like... Oh, it was great, except liquor. Now we had liabilities, capital, retained earnings, right? And uh, I'm sorry, uh, liabilities, uh, retained earnings. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. Liabilities, common stock, retained earnings, and revenue. So liquor now became like you really sound drunk. It was like liquor. Right, so that was really the only modification I had to make to liquor. I had two R's instead of just one R, and the common stock was now uh, replacing capital. Retained earnings was replacing capital. So again, debit A still works, liquor still works, just an extra R in liquor, you know. But yeah, but I was thrilled when I'm like, oh my god, it works for that too. This is awesome, so you know. I don't. I never actually made a second one, uh, but that's interesting. I always wanted to, just never pull that trigger. <clears throat> but anyways, close dividends into retained earnings. So notice how in the yellow you have closed income summary into capital, closed drawing into capital. In the new way, or the corporation way, not really new, but just corporation way, you're closing uh, in number three and number four into retained earnings. So closing entry number four, you're going to debit retained earnings. And you're going to now close dividends. Because, again, dividends is a debit aid account, which means it would normally carry a debit balance, and to close it, you would have to credit it. <clears throat> so that was the initial reason why I wanted to introduce retainer, which you can't see it, but it's up here. But that was the second hat. So if you really think about things for a second, we used to have capital, and capital did the investments. Remember the first entry in the yellow? Owner made an investment, debit cash, credit capital. And then when we did closing entries, capital also handled the earnings portion. So capital was working like A shift and B shift in this system. It was doing, you know, it's kind of like in English how we say right or correct, or left and right. The word right, if you hear it, has so many different meanings. Well, capital did two different jobs. So whoever invented corporation accounting went and looked and said, we got to do something different. Capital you know, did too much work in this environment. Let's have one account handle the investment stocks, and let's have another account handle the earnings, the net income, the net losses, 
and they created three channels. So literally, one account split into two. And that's been that way for hundreds of years. I don't know exactly when it started, but that's the, the concept there. <clears throat> okay. I think this is a good spot to end night one. I hope I've kind of wet your whistle a little bit in terms of what what's ahead of you here. Here's what I need you to do. If you haven't read this chapter, I need you to try and dive into it, right? A lot of the stuff, some of the lingo now, you might be able to kind of like, oh, I got that. I think I know what he's, that makes more sense now after reading it. But then you're going to get to the second half of the chapter and you're going to go, oh, he's going to be covering this. I don't understand it. But still try and read it anyways, right? So I'm not asking you to do any pre-work in this chapter. I'm actually just asking you to just read about it, right? And then let me fill in the blanks next week, right? And... <clears throat> and like I said, I'm pretty sure I've got a YouTube video on the material that we're doing this week, next week, and the week after. So I think I've got one of each. So worst case scenario, you always have those to fall back on. But this is the introduction night of, you know, letting you know there are new accounts that you have to be exposed to. And then after this, we'll, uh, we'll get into a little bit. Let me just give you a little sneak peek to next week. Next week, we'll talk about how dividends are distributed. You know, who has first crack? Preferred stockholders get first crack at dividends. So if your company has preferred stockholders and common, the preferred people get the first money in their pocket. And then whatever's left goes to common. We'll talk about that next week. We'll also talk about the three important dividend dates, the date of record, uh, the date of distribution, the date of payment. So there's three important dates. The date of record is the only one that does not require a journal entry. So you have to be a stockholder on the day the, st the corporation said, this is the day we're issuing stock or issuing a dividend. Now, you as a stockholder are not privy to that information because if you knew when a corporation was paying out a dividend, you would take all the money you own and you would go buy that stock the day before. So if you know that, that's part of insider trading. And you can go to jail for that and people have gone to jail for that. Right? So, uh, so you could have owned the stock for like 50 years and sold it yesterday. right? And then I could have bought the stock yesterday. Whoever is the owner of that stock on the date of record, they're the ones who are entitled to the dividend. So it has nothing to do with longevity. It's not, are you the owner as of that date of the stock? Then you get a dividend. Right? So we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about stock dividends next week. So let's say a company doesn't have cash, enough cash flow to appease its stockholders. Because a lot of companies, a lot of people, when they buy stock, they'll buy stock based on the company's reputation of giving out dividends. It's like interest on a loan kind of thing, earning interest. So people look for that. If your company, did I say look for that? <laughs> I don't know how that came out like that. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> I wanted to listen to that. That was pretty funny. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, let's just talk, you know, street now. Um, but bottom line is, if a company doesn't have the cash flow, they will give out a stock dividend. And a stock dividend is kind of like when a baby cries and you stick that pacifier in their face, right? Shut up. Well, a stock dividend kind of uh, kind of has that same effect. It's like, well, they didn't give a cash dividend, but they did give a stock dividend. So a stock dividend is a temporary appeasement, but could turn into gold down the road. So let's say you own a uh, thousand shares of, let's say Tesla, right? And Tesla gives a 10% stock dividend. So those thousand shares multiplied by 10%, all of a sudden they just gave you 100 free shares that you don't have to pay for. Right? So now you have 1,100 shares, right? Now when they do decide to give a cash dividend, so okay, we're going to give two dollars for every share you have. Well, you now have 1,100 shares times $2. You're going to get a check for 2,200 instead of for 2,000. Okay? So the stock dividend could turn out to be 
really good, right? There's also something called stock splits. A stock split is like the the hidden jewel. Like remember that necklace in the Titanic that they threw overboard? That's what a stock split could be if you find the right one. Just give me an example. If you had, I can't remember if it's 10,000 shares or a $10,000 investment. I'm going to go with shares as my gut instinct. But in the early 90s, if you had the wherewithal to invest in, you've got mail. Remember AOL? <laughs> All right. AOL stock split seven or eight years in a row. So if you had 10,000 shares, after one year you now had 20,000 shares. After two years you now had 40,000 shares. You didn't spend any extra money. The stock kept splitting. Why does the stock split? Because it gets too expensive in the stock market. So just as an example, let's say you've got 10,000 shares at $10. 10,000 times 10, $100,000 is your portfolio, right? And now it splits, let's say two for one. So instead of having 10,000 shares, you now have 20,000 shares, but they're no longer selling for 10, they're selling for five. 20,000 times five, your portfolio is still 100,000. So your portfolio total does not change. But if the stock splits again, that means the price went up again. So chances are, no chance, this happened with AOL stock. If you had 10,000 shares, by the time those seven years were up, you were a millionaire, multi-millionaire. Just because the stock kept splitting, the price would come down, it would go back up. Split again, it would come down, go back up, and it would continue to split. But yet, so at the end, you had all these shares that you didn't pay anything for, and now you can sell them for like you know, $100 a share, or $200 a share, whatever they were going. But crazy, you know, if you have the money, Maybe you can make money. Every time something comes along, I don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's like, ah. Not that I would have had the wherewithal to see that either, but you know, I've never had the money to play with. So that I can just talk about it and never really truly experience it. But anyways, so that's the kind of stuff we'll get into next week as well. But we'll see the accounting side. You know, what's the journal entry when this happens? And then the third week, if we don't get to it next week, which I don't think we will. But in the third week, we'll get into treasury stock. Treasury stock is when a company buys back its own stock, goes on the stock market, and takes it off the stock market. And why would they do something like that? Well, there's this really hot shot guy named Johnny, right? And he's buying all of, let's say, you know, Kevin's stock, all right? Kevin's stock is selling like crazy, and this. So this one company called Johnny Corp just keeps buying all this Kevin stock. And Kevin's like, oh, shit, what's happening here? We better play some defense. So all of a sudden, Kevin removes his stock off the market so that Johnny can't buy more. If Johnny buys 50% or more, he is now the deciding vote. He is now you know, basically running the show. So a company will will take its stock off the market to play defense, to avoid kind of like a, uh, um, what do they call it, a hostile takeover kind of thing. So we'll see the accounting end of that. So this chapter is just filled with goodies. You know, it's just a matter of when you read it, you might hear some of the stuff even that I just kind of recapped, or not really recapped, previewed the next two weeks. Maybe when you read it, you go, oh, that's what he meant. That sounds pretty cool. Or, you know, I'm not expecting you to, Understand the accounting, just be aware and exposure to it. Okay, Kevin? Um, so you said that they do have to play defense. So is that like legal to do? Like, don't they have to have a reason to get stuff? No, they don't have a, they don't need a reason, but that's usually the reason why. There is one other reason. I think your book gives like a list of five or six, but that's usually number one. Uh, I don't know if it's number two or number three or whatever, but another reason might be uh, it's kind of like the, uh, relationship um, uh, when when two people are in a relationship and all of a sudden one starts playing hard to get doesn't the other one all of a sudden want that person a little bit more now yeah you know what I'm talking about where so in kind of like that that whole psychology of, of things so if you 
remove your stock off the stock market, all of a sudden people want it more. So that's not like the major reason, but that is another reason why a company might do that. You know, it's kind of like uh, you know a company like Coca Cola when they changed when they went from the Coca Cola recipe to New Coke. People shit their pants, well, not because the new coke tasted bad, but because they couldn't believe the coke that they were so used to for decades was gone. And everyone thinks, oh, that was like the biggest mistake coke ever made. And I'm like, I know that. Right? Coke did that on purpose. You know, at least that's my my thinking. They they literally took their flavor away and replaced it with something that tasted more like Pepsi. But the Coke lovers, you know, the Coke sales just plummeted, and then all of a sudden Coke's like, all right, we'll bring back the old recipe, and then it just went through the roof, and that's, you know, the rest is history. But people say it was a mistake. I believe it was total strategy on their part. But it's kind of like the same thing. Anyways, get that all out of there. You know, read this chapter. Get caught up. I know some of you owe me a boatload of stuff. Please get it to me. I think I sent a, an email of what, you know, check your grade book. If you have any zeros, get that stuff in the mini ASAP. All right? We'll talk to you later. I'll upload these notes in the Blackboard and then a recording of what we did tonight as well. So if I said some swear words, that's another teacher that just happened to jump in. All right. See ya. Yes. I emailed that to you. Oh, thank you for reminding me, because sometimes I'll open an email up, and then it's not folded anymore, and then I forget that I opened it. So thank you. If you don't see any grade in the next two days, just send me a reminder email-wise. Okay. okay, thank you. You too. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. No. No. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. To protect themselves? Right. Unbelievable. Have you guys ever seen The Wolf of Wall Street, the movie? Yeah. Okay. That's a pretty intense movie. And, you know, it deals with penny stocks and things of that nature. I mean, it's pretty graphic stuff that's in there, pretty rated R, you know, maybe a little bit higher than rated R. But, yeah. I think it was based on a true story as well, yeah. But really crazy. Like, I wish I could show that movie, but it'd be just too, like, uh, people would go, oh my god! <laughs> I don't, but the only stock that I'm invested in is uh, it's through well my 401k. My entire retirement is based on stock. And when Trump was president, my uh, stock portfolio, my 401k went through the roof. I was earning the last two years, and that's including the pandemic, over. 30% return. That's unheard of. I mean, if you get 10% return, you're happy. It's getting 30% the last two years of Trump's, maybe two and a half years of Trump's reign, right? No. For, for, my, for my 401k, I was sad to see him go. You know, it's like, no! Now with Biden... 8%, 9%. I was losing money the first few months of the year. It's now starting to recover. You know? No, I know. That's correct. Yeah, I looked at it strictly from a financial standpoint. Sure, sure. Yeah, I didn't like him either. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. He pissed a lot of people off. He drained the swamp, as he said, and it really ticked a lot of people off. You know, kind of did things a little differently. His approach. Isn't it I crazy think, part is, even though we like nobody liked him, he still did whatever he 
That's right. That's right. That's a great point. Yeah, he really did. But who knows? He might come back or some form of him will come back. You never know. But uh, as I approach retirement age, I wish he had one more term because it's like, oh, you know, four more years of those kind of returns. I'd retire at 62 instead of waiting till 65 or whatever. But now I don't know. You know. Right. That's correct. started in my 401k I was 25 years old never you never envision like retirement when you're that young you know ah, it'll be so it's amazing I'm like I'm getting close to that. I can't believe it you know I feel still feel like it's up with a stupid back you know I still feel like I'm in my 20s and 30s you know but you know you just have to stay conservative you have to but when you're young honestly um, you know when I was 25 if you ask to ask a financial planner, how do I invest? Be risky. The opposite of conservative. In fact, until I hit my 50s, in fact, I'm still not conservative. I'm still at that. So, you know, my stocks are still in risky or volatile areas because I'm trying to get a higher return. But the older you get, the more you need to pull back because you no longer have all those years to recover. You know, and if you remember in the late 2000s when the whole economy went down the tubes. I remember in my 401k, I had $100,000. I had earned that much in 15 years of working, maybe even longer than that, 20 years actually. And then in two, three months, I saw it go from 100,000 down to 60. And I'm like, oh my God, what? It, people literally were not retired anymore during the late 2000s. Some people kill themselves. They, they committed suicide because they thought they were going to live on this much in retirement, and now it was this much. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I saw my account drop over $100,000, but it recovered, you know, thank God and that kind of thing. But, yeah, it's, it's crazy, you know, but the, all you guys are young, you know, when your money's in the stock market, be willing to take those risks because you can recover. But the older you get, not so much, you know. <laughs> but you got time to recover. Yeah, I don't know. Bitcoin was one of them. The whole Codex Europe was one of them. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I was, I'm in a Tesla, and I, I've been in it for a couple of years. Maybe two years. That's a great stock to be in. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah. I remember it for pretty long, but uh, it's what? Do you listen to me? Wow. Do you listen to me? Um, uh, Twitter, please? Uh -huh. yeah. No. Yeah, I to he can't basically tell you word for word. He, he just he tweets in emoji. Yeah. Really? Like he did something about rocket, water, moon, or something, right? Saying that it was a stock that was going to shoot for the moon. Basically, he said it. But they have to, it's called smart money. Or they mm -hmm. have to be focused. Because they got money. You know what well, yeah, right now, like uh, Reddit and um, they literally can control the stock market. Like if you look at like uh, GameStop stock and like all that, that was all a bunch of people with hundred followers. Yeah, about it. Shopify is supposed to be another one that's and, uh, a good one to get right. into. And everyone on bought it. And it was, uh, good I'm returns. More a, I'm more of a long. Thing. And that's the way. Right. That that's a smart way to go. I don't have to I mean, I think many stocks are <laughs> well, you well, just I mean, right. I just buy a stock and then they know. The whole stock just completely crashes. I'm still fine. Right. If you've got a 